The American Airlines captain was done for the day, heading home for some time on the lake with his son. A fellow pilot caught him in the terminal and asked him for a favor. The captain never made it to the lake. The worst plane crash in the U.S. and what general aviation can take from it right now on taking off. The no-win situation, the Kobayashi Maru. For those nerds out there that get this reference, I like you already. I'm Dan Milliken, and the crash we're studying today was a no-win scenario for the pilots. And for you general aviation folks, stick with me. I'll bring it home by the end of how this airline crash is relevant for me and you. What can make us better pilots and better people. American Airlines Flight 191 on May 25, 1979, Chicago O'Hare, 271 souls aboard a McDonnell Douglas DC-10, along with two people on the ground, lost their lives in a fiery crash shortly after takeoff. What happened and what can we learn? Well, the DC-10 in 1979 was still new, about eight years in service. But in that time, before Flight 191, there had already been three fatal accidents involving the DC-10. It was very similar to the 737 MAX situation of today, and we'll get into that shortly. Also, don't want to confuse American Flight 191 with Delta Flight 191 that crashed with wind shear at DFW. And if you get on a flight and find it's 191, you might reconsider boarding. While an airline might retire a number, other airlines might still use them. Today, you won't find a Flight 191 with either American or Delta. Also, all 9-11 flights numbers have been retired. American Airlines Flight 191 was the fourth fatal crash of the DC-10. So the pressure on the FAA was huge, and they did in fact ground the entire fleet of them in the aftermath for about a month, which was a huge ding to the airlines, and even more so to McDonnell Douglas, who never really recovered and was eventually bought out by Boeing. On May 25th, the wide-bodied three-engine jet was fully loaded. 271 people, the captain and the first officer were very experienced. And like I mentioned at the top, the captain wasn't even scheduled for this trip, but was a last-minute fill-in. The pushback, the taxi, they were all normal. The tower cleared 191 for takeoff, and they began the roll. At V1, the first officer, who was the pilot flying, began to rotate. They felt a huge jolt and lost power in the left engine. The first officer muttered, damn. He immediately did what they were trained to do on an engine out after rotate. So they slowly climbed, getting up over 300 feet. Then more trouble. The airplane banked heavily to the left, going past 100 degrees and nose down into the train near a trailer park in a garage, killing everyone aboard instantly and two people on the ground. An amateur photographer out at O'Hare happened to be taking pictures. And here's the audio from the tower. The pilots didn't know that the left engine had in fact come off and over the wing. And when it did that, the power to their instruments was severed. Also, a three-foot section of the leading edge of the wing was taken out. And worst of all, both the primary and secondary hydraulic lines were severed and the slats lost pressure and retracted on the left wing. For those that are familiar with the principle of lift, the more surface area you have, the more lift is produced but also the more drag. So if your wing was a, a one-size-fits-all, it might be designed for that lift, but would not be able to go very fast. If you design for speed at altitude, then you might take longer to get airborne if you've got a one-size-fits-all. So fast planes like airliners are designed where the front of the wing can extend forward to give the wing more surface area. They call these things slats. And with the slats pushed back, on the left wing because of hydraulic failure and with the engine thrust reduced as called for by the emergency procedures, the plane slowed down. If the slats had been out, there wouldn't have been a problem. But when the left wing lost the slats, the left wing stalled. So the plane 
rolled left and down. And by the way, in the 70s, the stick shaker effect that warns pilots when a plane is about to stall was an optional feature for the co-pilot. American did not purchase that option in that airplane. We'll never know what the pilots said to each other because after the engine flew off, the electrical power to the cockpit voice recorder was generated by the left engine. As you can surmise, many systems were re redesigned after this crash. And I want to stress, this flight crew did everything by the book. They did it right. And still, they and all the rest of them lost their lives. The NTSB today is slow and methodical, and some aviation people believe way too slow. But in May of 1979, the lead for the NTSB was quick. Only two days after the accident, he held up a sheared pylon bolt announcing they had the culprit. And even today, I was talking to a veteran airline captain about this accident, and he told me, oh yeah, the one with the bolt failure. No, it wasn't the bolt. In those first few days, this jump to conclusions absolutely hurt McDonnell Douglas, perhaps fatally. The CFI rule of primacy that we learn for education, the first thing you hear or learn is what you remember. Well, that's certainly been the case here, like the veteran airline captain I mentioned earlier. But it wasn't a bolt issue. It wasn't really even a design flaw. It was a maintenance problem, one that McDonnell Douglas had recommended the carriers don't do. You see, eight weeks before, at the American Airlines Maintenance Center in Oklahoma, this DC-10 was in for routine engine maintenance. McDonnell Douglas called for the removal of the engine to be done first with the engine and then the pylon from the wing. But American, as well as United and Continental, found out that if they keep the engine and pylon attached, they can save 200 hours. But more importantly, they said, it was for safety because they didn't have to disconnect hoses and systems and run the risk of problems reconnecting. So they drove a forklift under the engine and undid the pylon. Now the balance point for the engine was very precarious, you know, like an egg, and had to be exact. So the crew positioned the forklift under the engine pylon assembly and undid the two forward pylon bolts and the one rear pylon bolt from the pylon's metal plates or flanges. And at that moment, the bell rang. It was time for a shift change. They walked away. The forklift hydraulic settled and the engine dropped. And as the engine dropped, it pushed the rear pylon up into the wing which fractured the metal flange. It was this metal flange that gave way eight weeks later, causing the engine to separate, fly up and over the left wing. So the FAA, feeling global pressure with this fourth fatal accident of the new DC-10, grounded the fleet in the US and forbid any foreign DC-10s from coming over. McDonnell Douglas saw order after order canceled. And the crazy thing, was that the DC-10 ended up with an incredibly strong safety record. But the plane was grounded uh, for about a month. Now, in comparison, it's been a lot longer for the 737 MAX, no doubt taking a big toll on Boeing. But in the aftermath of Flight 191, maintenance procedures were changed. Engine out procedures were adjusted as well. Hydraulics and electrical systems changed. Many, many recommendations from the NTSB from this crash were accepted and implemented by the FAA. Now let's take this forward to how it can affect me and my flying and hopefully yours. First, my propensity to justify easier or cheaper ways and how that can affect safety. Uh, just recently, I stretched a flight a little further than was comfortable so I could get to the airport with the cheaper Avgas. I spent that last 15 minutes scouring the terrain for an engine out landing pl place because I was really worried. All that to save what, 40 bucks? The people in charge at American told themselves that this shortcut was actually safer. There were fewer touch points, fewer hose disconnects, fewer chances for failure. But at the end of the day, the real motive was saving money. You know, it, it's like playing chess. I'm impulsive and I would lose a chess match because I was too quick with my moves. But if I kept my finger on the piece and I looked all around at the ramifications, I could sometimes save myself. And that's what I learned from this tragedy. Don't fool myself with quick justifications and seemingly noble reasons, and make sure I look at all the possibilities before impulsively taking an action, like deciding where I'll fill up. 
Another thing, when you look at the Southwest 1380 flight, when the engine failed and the shrapnel pierced the cabin, killing a passenger, you listen to Captain Tammy Jo Schultz. There were times they didn't follow procedure because she felt that would worsen the situation. For instance, flap settings and landing speeds. She adjusted based on what she felt was safe. The takeaway for me is this. Going by the book is a starting point, a reference, and a good one. Use all the factors when faced with an emergency. Get as complete a picture as possible to enable you to make the right choices. There's no slam on the heroic effort of the flight crew of 191. They did not have the time or the complete picture of what was going on. And that's the last thing. You, you do your best, and that's all you can do. Those are my takeaways from the worst crash in U.S. history. I don't want to lie to myself to justify a lazier or cheaper course of action and jeopardize my safety and others that are with me or on the ground. And I want to keep my hand on the chess piece until I've taken a good look at all the possibilities. And going by the book is a starting point, but making decisions based on as much of a complete picture as possible is important. I hope you can take away something as well that makes you a better pilot and a better person. Leave me a comment on what you've pulled from this crash. And remember, superior judgment trumps superior skills. Be safe.